Grace and peace be yours in abundance from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you. I need help. <laughs> okay, so just before I dive into the service this morning, there's another two announcements that are really important. Well, you know. So congratulations to Russell and Carol to Taran. They are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary this weekend. How cool is that? <laughs> okay, the other announcement probably isn't so important, but it is to me. Um, I'm in charge of small groups, and I want to get the small groups organised within the next two weeks. Because after that, I go on vacation for a week and they start up when I get back. So there's announcement in your bulletin, there's announcement on the website saying, hey, think about this, and if you're interested in leading a small group, please contact me. So by August 12, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, as we worship today, my hope is that God's love will compel us to action that we will be compelled by his love to be willing to do whatever he calls us to do. Um, yes, so today is a house of prayer service. And the folk, reason we do this is Isaiah 56 and verse 7. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Let's pray. Great God, thank you that you are here in this place. We pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, Lord, and help me to not get in your way. Thanks, God. We love you. Amen. God wants his place to be a house of prayer, a place of acceptance and joy and inclusivity. And today, my message is going to be shorter so that we have time for you to be in prayer. You'll be able to connect with God praying silently and individually, uh, praying with an elder, because later on there's going to be elders walking up and down the aisles to be able to pray with you and for you. Uh, you will have time to be listening to God and writing to him and singing to him, meditating on the word. It's a time of being in his presence. 1 Timothy Chapter 2 and verse 1 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. So the Bible calls us to pray on behalf of others, intercessorily, uh, giving thanks, whatever it is that we need. And so as the elders go up and down the aisles, both down here and on the balcony, later on in the service, you can stand up, raise your hand, and give to them what it is that you would like them to pray for you or how to pray for you. If you desire to be anointed with oil in accordance with James chapter 5 and verse 14, then we can do that. Each of the elders will have a little bottle of oil with them. James 5.14, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. And when you are being anointed with oil, what you are saying is, I desire that God's will through the Holy Spirit be done in my life, in my body, in my heart, in my mind, in my circumstances. Whatever it is, I am inviting God to be free to do his work in me and to bring healing as needed. Okay, so our theme for today. Anything? Anything, Lord. The Bible is full full of stories of God calling people to do things for him, and they respond with yes in varying degrees of willingness. God called Noah to build an ark at a time when the earth didn't have any rain or floods, 
but he had to build this great big ship and it took him 120 years to do it. And the whole time he was building it, he was preaching about what was coming and he was ridiculed and heckled. Then God called Terah, who was the father of Abraham, called him to move his family from Ur the Chaldees to a place called Canaan. We see that in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31. Terah obeyed. He headed from the Ur of the Chaldees up to a place called Haran at the top of the Mesopotamian Valley, and he stayed there. It seems he got stuck there because he died in Haran. Maybe at some point he stopped listening to God and, and got stuck. So what do we do? Ask yourself, oops, did I go too far? There it is. Lord, what in my life causes me to get stuck and stop following where he's leading? Lord, help me to be aware of when I'm stuck, when I've stopped listening and obeying. Help me. We all need help. Okay. And then God calls Abram. This is Terah's son, later on known as Abraham. And God calls Abram to take the family and move them from Haran down to Canaan. At first, in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, take them to a land I will show you. But in verse 5, it tells us he was moving them to Canaan. They get to Canaan. It's a land fully inhabited already. And God's promising Abram that this is going to be his land, which like seems impossible in that moment. Um, there's a famine in the land at the time, so Abram decides he's just going to keep on traveling down through Canaan, down to Egypt, and he lands in Egypt. So Abram seems to be listening to God. He seems to be going where God's calling him to go, seems to be obedient, but it also seems he went a little beyond what God was calling him to do, and he headed off on his own path. So maybe we need to ask ourselves, Lord, have I stepped out and headed off in my own direction? Am I still listening to you and walking with you? So as we read through the stories of the Bible, think about these things and how do they apply to me? Hundreds of years later, God called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. Now, Moses had some training for this position. He grew up in Pharaoh's court. He'd learnt reading and writing and strategy and leadership and management. And so for 40 years, he thought he was somebody. He knew he was somebody. Then he relocated to another land and another role. Shepherd. He got to talk to sheep all day. Not very stimulating conversation. But while he was there, he got some more training for the role God had called him to. He learnt humility. He learnt dependence on the great shepherd. He spent 40 years knowing that he was a nobody. Then God called him to lead the children of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. Uh, Moses argued the point, but ultimately he said yes. And then God worked through him for 40 years, helping him to be able to lead the children. And at this point, God was able to use him because he had learnt humility. He had learnt to be fully dependent on his great and good God. Moses is mentioned 85 times in the New Testament. He became somebody significant because he knew he was fully dependent on his great and good God. So Moses basically was praying, Lord, I will go wherever you call me to go. I will do whatever you call me to do. There are many other stories. Daniel got taken captive in Babylon and he was made a eunuch. Not a happy experience. Ezekiel was ridiculed all of his life. Jeremiah was imprisoned in dungeons and pits. Elijah was hated by the power people in the land, the king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel. Paul was beaten, imprisoned and run out of nearly every town he was ever in. We know all these stories. We know that when God calls us to do something, it does not necessarily mean that we will have a comfortable and prosperous life. Knowing this, are you scared to pray the anything prayer? Lord, I will do anything you call me to do. If you're scared, what's the reason? Perhaps you are scared that the Lord will call you to give up something. You have to fill in the blank there because I don't know each of your circumstances. Is God calling you to be single 
when you desperately want to be married and have children? Is God calling you to a life of service in a low-paying, thankless industry when you have the skills and ability to be earning six figures and having lots of power? Is God calling you to a path that will incur rejection from others as they decide that what you're doing is something wrong? What are you afraid of? What holds you back from praying anything, Lord? I will do anything you call me to do. I will go anywhere you call me to go. I will be anything you call me to be. Let's be real. Fear is major. Fear that God will call you to do something which brings discomfort, disappointment, squash dreams, something for which you feel inadequate. Fear that others will ridicule you or reject you. Fear that you might resent God if things don't work out the way you want. Fear is Satan's weapon to restrain us from experiencing the amazing life that God has planned for us. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. In that same chapter, 1 John chapter 4 and verses 8 and 16, it tells us that God is love. He is that perfect love. And when that perfect love fills us, floods our being, fills our hearts and our minds, there is no room for fear. When we know God intimately, we trust him. He is good and he is great. He is love. He is faithful. He is compassion, grace, forgiveness, peace, joy. He is trustworthy. So what holds us back from praying the anything prayer? Maybe our thoughts should not be, oh Lord, what will I miss out on if I pray the anything prayer? Maybe our thoughts should be, what will I miss out on if I choose not to follow you completely? When you think about the things that hold you back from truly praying anything, Lord, where is your focus? Is your focus on your experience, your likes and dislikes, your hopes and dreams for a good life? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to have hopes and dreams. It's good to know yourself, to know what your likes and dislikes are. It's good to desire positive experiences. The Bible tells us that God calls us to come to him to find rest for our souls, to find peace that is beyond understanding, to have joy complete and life abundant. And these are all positive experiences. However... The path to experiencing those things might look a little bit different from what you imagine they will to start with. Am I willing to let go of my dreams and run with God's dreams? Last time I spoke here, I shared with you that my dream was to be a high school teacher, to teach history and English, and God's dream for me was very different. His dream was for me to do theology. And at that point in my life, I was praying the anything prayer. I just didn't realize I was. My heart was willing to do whatever God wanted me to do. I just wanted to make sure that it was him calling me. And I told you the story last time of how God convinced me to do theology. And so I let go of my dream and I took on his dream. I shared that at the end of my degree, God gave me a job teaching high school, but I taught Bible instead of history and English. So it was even better than what I dreamed. It was really good. Um, However, I felt absolutely inadequate at the start of the process. In my four-year theology degree, I had not done a single education subject. I knew nothing about classroom management or curriculum development or anything like that. But God had called me to do that, so I said yes. And it was amazing. I loved my time as a high school teacher. Really loved it. Very, very fond memories. 
When I did my theology degree, back in the dark ages, there were no women in ministry at that point. And for four years, I constantly had people telling me that I should not be doing this. This was no place for a woman. Uh, what I was doing was against God. I was charging off my own direction, and I would have to suffer the consequences that I was even following Satan. Some of my closest friends totally disagreed with me doing theology and uh, felt very strongly that I should not be doing it. So we agreed to disagree and not talk about that topic. When I started the theology degree, I was a young lady. I was 17 years old. And uh, at that point in my life, I had an almost pathological need to be liked by everyone. Can you imagine what it was like for me to do four years? of rejection and opposition. But I wouldn't trade it for anything, really, anything. I learned during that four years to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, not on other people, to listen to Jesus through his word and the Holy Spirit, to seek him first and always. That four years was the best gift God could have ever given to me because it set the tone for the rest of my life, the tone of seeking God and listening to him no matter what. What a gift. Didn't think it would be, but it was. During that time, I also realized that the focus is kingdom building. It's not about me and what will make my life happy and comfortable. My focus is about kingdom building. Lord, what do you want me to do with you today in building the kingdom? Start your day with that prayer every day. It's a form of the anything prayer. Lord, I am open today for you to do for me to do whatever you want me to do in building the kingdom with you. During that four years of theology at Avondale, uh, in the first year or the second year, I can't remember which one, I heard a sermon from one of my lecturers and it was on a passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 21. And this instantly became one of my favourite passages of scripture. So I'm just going to race through that. It starts off, verse 14, for Christ's love compels us. So what's our starting point? Amen. His love is the motivation for everything that we are and everything that we do. Verse 14 continues, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Christ died so that we might live. We all died in him, being set free from the captivity of sin. We die to self and are made alive in Christ. Verse 15, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We die to self. We no longer live for ourselves. We live for Christ. Love compelled Christ to go to extreme lengths for me. And so love compels me to go to extreme lengths for Christ. We live for him. Verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded in Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So every person we come in contact with, we see through the lenses of God's incredible love for them, his sacrificial love for them. God loves them with an unstoppable, extravagant, radical love. And so every person we see, we need to love them with an unstoppable, extravagant, radical love as someone for whom Christ died. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. We stop focusing on our dreams, our wants, our desires. And instead, we focus on God's dreams, God's wants, God's desires. And that is a radical change. Verse 18, all this is from God. This change cannot be something that we conjure up or work on in our own strength. We can no more change from selfish, self-focused beings to generous, other-centered beings than a leopard can change its spots. 
The change comes from God. The Holy Spirit brings about the transformation through the renewing of our minds. So verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is the focus. This is where it's at. This is the really important stuff, opening space for others to be reconciled to Christ. It is not about what I want or what I am afraid God will ask me to do. It is about building the kingdom of God. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. So what is the good news, the message that we are to share? God was in Christ as he hung on the cross. God in Christ felt the pain from all of our sins. God is grace. God does not count our sins against us because he suffered the death that our sins bring. He set us free to live life, to have life abundant we are saved by grace through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Love compels us to fulfill this ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 continues, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Whatever God calls us to do, it is a work of love, a work of reconciliation that brings life. It is true, God might call you to do something that is not pleasant or comfortable. So what? What he went through for us was not pleasant or comfortable. And when God calls us, he equips us. He transforms us by the renewing of our mind. He strengthens us and gives us peace and rest for our souls. And at the end of the day, the journey might have looked really different from what we first envisaged. However, it will be beautiful because we have been walking with God. And we wouldn't change any of it. Throughout the rest of the service, please talk with the Lord. And if you are able to, pray the anything prayer. Lord, I will do anything you ask me to do. I will go anywhere you ask me to go. I will be anything you ask me to be. If you hesitate to pray that prayer wholeheartedly, then ask God, what's holding me back? What's making me hesitate? And listen to him. Identify what it is that's restraining you. What are the fears that are constraining you? We have some exciting things happening in the rest of our service time today. We have voting into membership of people who got baptised during camp meeting. We have recognition and celebration of a child dedication last Sabbath. We have a baby dedication today. We'll have a children's story. While all these things are happening, please take the time to pray, to listen to God as he speaks to you, I pray that you will hear him loudly and clearly to let you know if there is anything restraining you from being free to pray the anything prayer. And then make a commitment to God to surrender to him whatever it is that restrains you or holds you back. Make a commitment to pray every day the anything prayer. In your bulletins, you have an insert, a piece of paper. I'd invite you to use that to write down the things that are holding you captive, robbing you of the delight of living free in Christ. 
Write down your commitment to surrender them to God. And write down the anything prayer and let it truly and honestly be the cry of your heart and keep that piece of paper somewhere that you can see it and access it easily. We are going to have a beautiful baby dedication right now. Massiel and the Fulston family are going to come up. And then after that, we'll have some other beautiful things and then pray. Great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy to receive power and glory and honor and praise. You are worthy for us to trust you with our lives, with every particle of our being. Lord, Satan's weapon is fear and it restrains us in so many different ways. God, help us please to recognize when we are in the grip of fear and it is holding us back and constraining us from being able to experience the incredible life that you desire for us. And Lord, help us to surrender it. To surrender to you anything in our lives that is restraining us from knowing you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Lord, help us to be fully open to you. Help us to remember every day to pray wholeheartedly, Lord, I am willing to do anything you ask me to today. I'm willing to go wherever you ask me to. I am willing to be whoever you ask me to be. Help us, Lord, to be fully open to you, to be free, to experience your peace, your rest, your joy, your life abundant. And help us to shout from the rafters the amazing things that you are doing in and through us. We love you, Lord. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>